are in listen-only mode. Uh, so hello everybody. Uh, good morning to everybody on the West Coast and afternoon to everyone on the East. Um, just want to uh, welcome you all to the chemotherapy side effects webinar with uh, hosted by Fight CRC um, with some of our colleagues at the University of Colorado uh, Cancer Center. So we're excited to have Ashley Boudet um, and uh, team on from Fight CRC to help facilitate uh, facilitate today's webinar. So a special thanks to Michael Sola, uh, Danielle Burgess, as well as Andrew Workman for all of the um, promotion of today um, and making sure that we're connected in with social media. And then, of course, also to Sharon Worrell for all of her leadership in the uh, patient education realm. And patient um, Ed will be, of course, uh, with Sharon's leadership facilitating questions um, today. So just a quick reminder, and Sharon will go through this as well to make sure um, through the typing um, announcement to remind everyone that if you have real-time questions that if you could please key those in um, we would really like for you to go ahead and do that real-time and we will go ahead and take those questions at the close of the webinar um, and have that facilitated with today's presenter as well as our team. So uh, thank you. We'll go ahead and get started uh, now. Next slide. Uh, just a quick reminder today that um, the, all of the uh, webinars are archived onto the Fight CRC site. If you are interested in uh, previous topics um, as well as today, please go ahead and visit that at our website. After the webinar, um, we've asked that you all please um, respond to us in a survey about your um, satisfaction or interest in additional topics um, based on what you've heard and seen today. And as a special thank you, you will get the a very exciting and uh, very much uh, popular iHeart Booty bracelet. And again, just a reminder that on the right side of the screen is where you key in those questions. And follow us on Twitter um, with a, a hashtag CRC webinar, um, just to make sure that you have also seen the uh, most salient points from today and love to see you guys engage in social media with our work. Next slide. A uh, quick, uh, quick reminder that we do have the resource line um, that's open to all colorectal cancer patient survivors as well as those who are interested in colorectal cancer prevention. We're excited because um, the Cancer Support Community is one of the agencies who works with us to support particularly the psychosocial components of questions that come through our line. Um, so just a reminder that that resource is um, very much available to everyone who are seeking information and guidance throughout their colorectal cancer journey. And then, of course, the I Heart to Booty, or I Heart to Booty, I Heart to Booty, well, myself, but the uh, To Booty podcast is uh, something that we're really uh, continuing to move forward. And so check out our website to learn more about the To Booty podcast series where we feature what are sometimes considered controversial and provocative subjects around colorectal cancer um, and issues related to cancer survivorship and treatment as well as prevention. Next slide. Uh, just a quick note, as we want to remind everyone at the outside of all of our educational offerings and gatherings, is that Fight CRC is intending um, to provide real-time and good information based on cancer treatment, survivorship, um, as well as prevention, but it is no way to replace direct medical care or serve as a surrogate for medical care that your physician or healthcare team might provide. A note that at any time, of course, that you um, have any specific issues related to emergent situations, um, 911 is always intended. Um, and just a reminder that we're here to help support that work. But of course, we ask that even throughout today's presentation um, and all, that we really maintain questions around the direct issues as opposed to very direct medical questions, as we do want to make sure that your medical team, who's the most uh, pertinent, responsible team, um, about your individual uh, group will continue to specifically provide input about your specific case. But of course, this um, webinar, as well as everything that we offer, is intended to help um, definitely inform those conversations. Next slide. And with that, um, I'm very excited to make the quick introduction uh, for Dr. Ashley Gaudet, who is an assistant professor here at the University of Colorado, um, who serves, serves as a farm D, um, specifically in the area of uh, helping support cancer patients um, with drug information, prescribed, or excuse me, um, for those who've been prescribed uh, medication, serving as a clinician to help uh, with the dispensement of medication, as well as providing supportive care and management. Um, for those who are on chemotherapy, um, definitely maintenance therapies, and then doing a lot of work around the counseling of toxicity monitoring 
um, and then also has a fair amount of research experience in this area. So I think it's really exciting that we have someone who um, isn't necessarily only a healthcare a provider in way of a physician or a nurse, but actually a pharmacist who's actually intermingling with patients and getting that perspective. So Ashley, with that, we're very excited to have you and really excited to hear more about your perspective of uh, side effects and symptom management, particularly around chemotherapy. So I'll turn it over to you, Ashley. Thank you very much. And thank you everyone for joining us on the call today. I'm very excited to share kind of my experiences in the Phase 1 GI clinic here at the University of Colorado. I really enjoy working with cancer patients and providing education. And I think that knowledge is really important to make sure that this is a su successful journey for everyone. Um, so let's begin. So this is going to be our webinar roadmap. So we're going to start with some commonly used chemotherapy agents and some targeted therapies. Then we'll move into discussing side effects and their management. And then some toxicity monitoring, key pieces, kind of timing of toxicity, what we're looking for, and how you can best communicate with your healthcare team. And reminder, just take your questions in. We'll have plenty of time at the end for me to answer them the best I can. So first, uh, colorectal cancer treatment is very complex. There are several different treatment options depending upon the patient's overall care plan, which is determined by patient-specific factors, kind of the patient stage, their plans, whether they're going to undergo surgery or radiation. And it's really important to make sure that you're aware of the uses of these agents and then the potential combinations of these agents, which we call regimens, when they're put together. So we have our traditional cytotoxic agents. So those are comprised of fluorouracil or 5-FU, you might hear it, leucovorin, keep cytobine, oxaliplatin, and arinotecan. Then we have some monoclonal antibodies, which typically bind to a specific marker to induce a response to, to the cancer. Um, and these are more specific for cancer cells and don't tend to cause as many side effects. So bevacizumab and zivaflibercept are two um, specific monoclonal antibodies. Then we have cetuximab and panitumumab that work very similarly. And then nivolumab and pembrolizumab. And all of these new drugs tend to be tongue twisters and aren't always easy to say. We have some two unique oral therapies that have recently been approved. And they're used typically after failure of traditional cytotoxic regimens. And those are regorafenib and trifluoridine to piracil. Um, it was used in clinical trials as TAS-102, so you may hear it referred to that when you're talking with some of your healthcare providers. So, Traditional cytotoxic agents act on the cell cycle's replication or growth. So it's often that you'll see some off-target side effects. So it doesn't specifically target just the replication of cancer cells, but other cells in your body. So that's why we refer to these as traditional cytotoxic agents. 5-FU or fluorouracil is kind of the backbone of most chemotherapy regimens. And it can be given as a bolus infusion through the vein over a few minutes or as a continuous infusion over hours to even two days. Most patients who receive this therapy will need a port placed, um, which is an under the skin device that we can infuse medication through directly into the vein. And the continuous infusion tends to be a little better tolerated and have less side effects than that bolus administration. But some regimens give both a bolus and a continuous infusion. Leucovorin or folinic acid is more of a supplement than a traditional actual chemotherapeutic agent, which helps increase the efficacy of the fluorouracil or 5-FU. And that's also given through the vein, typically as a rapid infusion. Then Cape Cytobine is basically what we call oral 5-FU. So it's the oral version of the IV fluorouracil, and it's given orally on a specific schedule based upon your regimen. And this is transformed into 5-FU in the body. So you need the body to turn it into the active chemotherapy. It's typically given twice a day uh, for 14 days straight with a one-week break. And most patients take between two and four tablets at a time. We recommend they take that within 30 minutes of finishing a meal. Food helps with the absorption of the chemotherapy drug and also helps minimize the risk of nausea. It's important when handling oral chemotherapy to remember to wash your hands afterwards, store it in a safe place that kids and pets couldn't get into it, 
and then also um, to make sure it's disposed of safely. So it's good to talk to your healthcare providers or your pharmacists about how to return any extra medicine you might have if you ever have a dose adjustment. Oxaliplatin, again, is an infusional cytotoxic drug, and it's typically given through the vein over two hours. And this medication is usually given in combination with other agents, such as the fluorouracil or mucavorin. And then arenatecan is another infusional cytotoxic drug that's rarely given alone, typically with 5-FU or maybe one of those monoclonal antibodies. Um, and that's a 90-minute infusion. So some common regimens using those traditional cytotoxic drugs are Folfox, or that's fluorouracil with leucovorin and oxaliplatin. Fulfiri, or fluorouracil, leucovorin, and arenatecan. And then Folfoxiri, or kind of putting both of those regimens together into one regimen, where you get fluorouracil, leucovorin, oxaliplatin, and arenatecan. These three regimens tend to be given every two weeks. And the 5-FU is given as a bolus plus the continuous infusion over two days, typically. The last regimen, CAPOX, combines both oral capecitabine with the infusional oxaliplatin. Um, this regimen may be more convenient for patients since they only have to come that first day to get oxaliplatin and then take the capecitabine orally at home for two weeks. So monoclonal antibodies is what we're going to discuss now. And these are more specific, again, for those markers expressed by the cancer cells, or they may work on certain drivers of cancer cell growth. These drugs are typically given through the vein in combination with those chemo regimens that we discussed on the previous slide. Bevacizumab, or Avastin, and Zivaflobercept are both monoclonal antibodies that work on the signaling of the blood vessels to try and prevent growth of the cancer. So they try to basically stop the water supply to the garden, if you will. Um, and the VEGF, or vascular endothelial growth factor, is what kind of receptor, or what kind of marker that we're targeting to help prevent that new blood vessel growth. Bevacizumab can be given over 30 to 90 minutes, depending upon the regimen and the dose. And um, it's typically given with those uh, chemotherapy regimens listed previously. So Folfox with Bevacizumab is an example. Zivaflobercept is kind of a newer version of Bevacizumab and works slightly differently. Um, but this drug, based on its approval, is only approved in combination with Fulfiri after failure of oxaliplatin-based therapy. So if you failed Folfox or Capox. And this is usually given over 60 minutes. Cetuximab and panitumumab are two monoclonal antibodies that work on the epidermal growth factor receptor, EGFR. And these receptors are commonly found on skin tissue. Um, unfortunately, not all patients are candidates to receive this therapy because you have to express a certain type of EGFR. Um, these are infused over one to two hours and can be given alone a single agent treatment or in combination with chemotherapy or chemotherapy regimens. It's important to note that um, these medications all can have infusion related reactions. So if you ever have a feeling of trouble breathing, warmth, um, it's always important to tell the nurses right away. Oops, sorry. So the last group of monoclonal antibodies we're going to discuss are immunotherapies. And these medications work to stimulate the immune system to attack the cancer cells. Nivolumab and pembrolizumab are both immunotherapy drugs that have been approved in other disease states, like lung cancer. And these are given only for specific type of colorectal cancer. So very few patients would be candidates for this type of therapy. Um, these medications are given over 30 to 60 minutes and are given by themselves. And it's important to note that these drugs, because you're trying to stimulate the immune system, don't typically have an immediate effect and take weeks to really see an impact on the cancer. And lastly, we'll discuss those unique oral therapies. So these agents were both recently approved for patients who have failed kind of our standard line regimens that we have already discussed. Regorafenib is an oral drug that works on multiple pathways that trigger cancer cell growth. It also acts on the vascular endothelial growth factor like bevacizumab and zivaflobercept. 
So you have similar side effects um, to the bevacizumab and zivacloverset drugs. This is given orally, and tablets should be swallowed whole with water and a low-fat meal. So a low-fat meal means less than 600 calories and less than 30% fat. This is given typically on days 1 through 21 of a 28-day cycle. So you have a week break before you start your next cycle. The triferidine into Piracil is also given orally, but this drug is given twice a day within one hour of finishing the morning and evening meals. And this schedule is days 1 through 5 and 8 through 12 of a 28-day cycle. And I find giving patients a calendar really helps with this schedule since it's not a continuous dosing and kind of has a unique schedule to follow. So now that we've talked about some basics of treatment options, let's talk a little bit more about side effects and how to manage them. And this is going to be the bulk of the presentation today. So we're going to start with our traditional cytotoxic agents and some general side effects of those medications. And because, again, the traditional cytotoxic drugs don't act just on the cancer cell, they also act on the, any rapidly dividing cell in the body. So bone marrow is a place where all of your blood cells are produced. And this tends to be a common site of side effects from traditional cytotoxic therapies. So we see a decrease in blood cell counts, which is things that we're monitoring through laboratory values, which we'll talk about later. Um, anemia is when your red blood cell count is lowered. And this can present as fatigue or shortness of breath, particularly with exercise or exertion. So when you walk up a flight of stairs, you might feel more tired. Um, we rarely need to give a patient red blood cell transfusions. Usually it doesn't drop to a severe level. Um, we may use erythropoiesis stimulating agents, or ESAs, to help stimulate red blood cell production. But these drugs aren't commonly used because they have their own set of side effects that can be concerning. Neutropenia is when the white blood cell count is lowered. And with that, we're worried about infection because the white blood cells are kind of your infection-fighting cells. And when you have fewer of those circulating in your body, it's harder to get rid of an infection if you have one, and you're at higher risk of getting an infection if someone around you might be sick. We can manage this with granulocyte colony-stimulating factors, which are a product that's given subcutaneously, so just under the skin, to help your bone marrow stimulate release of those immature white blood cells to help you fight off infections. We also recommend infection prophylaxis, so regular hand washing. Try to avoid anyone who's sick, especially close to your face. So if you have little kids around, try to kiss them on the forehead instead of close to their mouth or their runny nose. It is kind of that time of year, so it's not uncommon to see little kids with a runny nose. Also trying to keep any cuts you have clean and dressed so that they don't get infected. It's important to call your provider right away if you ever get a fever. Our threshold here is 100.5 Fahrenheit and any signs and symptoms of an infection. And we are in flu season right now, so think about kind of the chills, joint aches, kind of fatigue with a fever. We'd be worried about the flu right now. Also a tip is that over-the-counter pain medicines like Tylenol or acetaminophen and ibuprofen can mask a fever, so you wouldn't really have that fever response if you were infected. So talk to your providers about whether or not it's okay to take these if you are at risk for neutropenia. And last blood cell line that we think about is your platelets. And when those are lowered, we call that thrombocytopenia. Things that you might notice would be more bleeding. So when you brush your teeth or floss, you might see some gum bleeding. Or bruises that are larger or are new that you don't remember bumping into a cabinet or a stool or anything. Um, our platelets are responsible for forming the clots that help you stop bleeding. So this is why if you've got a nosebleed, it might take longer to stop. We rarely need to transfuse platelets to help reverse this lowered platelet count. Um, some additional tips are to avoid platelet inhibitors. So those would be your over-the-counter NSAIDs like aspirin or ibuprofen, and that would be a good thing to talk to your provider about. A lot of our patients tend to be on the baby dose of aspirin, so the 81 milligrams. So we recommend that they continue that for their heart protection. But if they do notice some bleeding, that would be something we would recommend they stop. 
Um, also, if you are on anticoagulation like anoxaparin or lovenox or warfarin, then we would monitor you very closely for any bleeding as well. Fatigue is another fairly common side effect. And this can happen due to the chemotherapy treatment or other causes like anemia. Um, having a lowered oxygen count, so if they did a test of your oxygen level through the pulse ox, or being depressed can lead to kind of feeling fatigued and less energy. The difference between typical fatigue and cancer-related fatigue is that this kind of fatigue doesn't really get any better if you take a nap or you rest. Um, most patients who have fatigue related to their chemotherapy treatment usually notice it a few days after their treatment. And this can be kind of a cumulative effect. So the longer they're on treatment, they may feel more tired. Some tips to help are exercise. So even getting up and walking around your house when you start to feel sleepy may help kind of relieve that fatigue and wake you up a little bit. Also prioritizing your tasks. So if you are tired and need a nap, make sure you do kind of your most important tasks in the morning when you're more awake. Um, taking naps as you need. So we recommend not more than an hour at a time, and definitely we don't want you napping all day so that you're missing meals. Um, a real key to napping is that we want you to feel a little better, but we know that naps aren't going to make you feel completely re-energized. Re we want you to just have that little burst of increased energy. And relax. Use kind of aromatherapy. Lavender is a good tip um, to kind of help relax you. Or take a bath. That will help you feel a little more uh, energized after. And getting a good night's sleep. So it's really hard having computers and iPads and cell phones all the time. So really try to avoid kind of that screen time before you go to bed. Any heavy meals. Um, and then try to keep a similar bedtime every night. So good general sleep hygiene. And then eating well. So make sure you've got a good diet. You're not waking up because you're hungry or you're not eating a ton of food before bed so that you feel full and can't sleep better. So chemo brain is one of the side effects that we unfortunately don't really know what causes it or how to prevent it or treat it. Um, some factors such as being stressed, fatigued, anemic, um, depressed, or not sleeping well can cause similar symptoms to chemo brain. And this affects up to 50% of patients. For most patients, kind of the symptoms improve over time, but it's something that's very slow to improve. And chemo brain basically is where you have trouble remembering things or you might feel like you're in a fog and can't think as clearly. So some tips to help with this are to make lists. Keep sticky notes and notepads all over your house when you think of something. Um, keep a schedule of tasks. So keep a good calendar so you know what you need to do when um, frequently to do items such as you know empty the dishwasher or even wash your clothes can need, be needed to be put on a calendar. Try not to multitask because that can stress your brain and it's very hard for you to focus on one task. You can try some mind building activities like crossword puzzles or Sudoku puzzles or there's uh, different programs and apps on the computer. There's a luminosity program that can help with mind building. Um, getting a good night's sleep so resting can help you focus a little better and ask for help. Don't you know, overcommit to things, delegate tasks to others, it's okay to ask for help when you need it. And definitely talk with your doctor or your provider about these symptoms because they could be related to those other causes like anemia. So we would want to look into that for you. And nausea vomiting is one of the most feared side effects of chemotherapy. Um, there's different types of nausea and vomiting, so there's acute, which typically happens within a day of your treatment, and then delayed, which can happen up to several days after treatment. There's anticipatory nausea, so when you think about going to get treatment or you see a nurse that has given you your infusion, then you just get that nauseous, queasy feeling. And then there can be breakthrough nausea, so despite what we give you to try to prevent nausea, you still have nausea, and then refractory nausea, where we have given you a lot of different medicines to prevent nausea, but you still are having uh, issues with nausea and vomiting. So it's important that we classify your nausea so that we can help manage it best. There's a lot of different medications that we can give to prevent nausea and vomiting and help you manage it. 
but the best prevention is to, or the best way to manage it is to prevent it in the first place. So if we do a good job the first time you get chemotherapy, it tends not to be an issue. Um, it's the people who have experienced it that we have a harder time controlling it again in the future. So one of the most common classes of drugs that we use to manage nausea and vomiting is the serotonin receptor antagonist. And medications like Zofran or Ondansetron or Granisetron or Pytrel are some drugs in that class. And this can be used um, as an as-needed basis, so we may give you this to take at home, or it can also be given before you start your chemotherapy treatment. Um, corticosteroids, so dexamethasone, is the most commonly used steroid to prevent nausea. And this medication um, is typically given as a preventative before you get chemotherapy, and sometimes may be given to you at home to take as needed or on a schedule. The, these two medication classes are the most commonly used to prevent nausea and vomiting before we give chemotherapy. So typically they're given in combination before you start cycle one, day one. The neurokinin-1 receptor antagonist, so apreptant, metupitant, olapitant, this is kind of the newest class of drugs, and these may be given uh, ahead of time or added on to those first two drug classes to help prevent nausea. We typically don't give this upfront to patients to prevent nausea, but if after the first cycle you had a really rough time, I would definitely let your providers know so that we may add on this to prevent nausea on your second cycle or future cycles. The phenothiazines, so clocorperazine or compazine and then promethazine or phenergan, these drugs we tend to give on an as-needed basis um, and they work on a different pathway. So if you're using a serotonin receptor antagonist as needed like Zofran or Ondansetron and that's not working, this might be something that we would add on. So we like to try to give medications that work in different manner to help manage nausea. The benzodiazepine class or lorazepam is really good at helping with anticipatory nausea. So it's good to take the night before your treatment and maybe the morning of your treatment as long as you have a driver because it can make you fairly drowsy. Um, and sometimes we'll even give it in the infusion center um, if someone's got a prolonged infusion because this only lasts for a couple of hours to help with that anticipatory nausea. And then some less commonly used drugs are the dopamine antagonists, so haloperidol or haldol and metoclopramide or reglan. Reglan or metoclopramide can help if you have kind of a full feeling after eating because it also helps stimulate the GI tract to kind of push the food through the system. And then lastly, our atypical antipsychotic olanzapine or Zyprexa has been added to the guidelines as a treatment option. It can be used both as the preventative stage and for patients who have refractory nausea and vomiting. So now we've discussed kind of some medications that we can give. There's also some non-pharmacologic ways to help manage nausea and vomiting. So ginger is a great option. And getting fresh ginger and making a fresh tea with the fresh ginger is a really good option because it helps you get some fluids in and also can help with that nausea feeling. Some people like hard ginger candy to suck on. Um, Dietary-wise, it's good to avoid any spicy or acidic or fatty foods because that can upset your stomach. Avoiding large meals as well, so trying to stick to something a little smaller and easier for your body to digest. It's really important to stay hydrated the best you can, so six to eight glasses of fluid. Um, drink a little bit at a time because kind of chugging a bottle of water may overload your system and make your stomach upset. Try to keep some bottle of water or some kind of fluid with you at all times. Um, some non-traditional ways to help manage nausea are acupuncture or acupressure, and certain pressure spots can help relieve nausea. Um, some people will do this on their own at home, or they may go see an acupuncturist. And then aromatherapy is another way to help manage nausea. So lemon, ginger, and peppermint are common scents um, that help with kind of the nausea feeling. I actually saw a patient yesterday who was using peppermint to help manage his nausea. And he would take the oil and put it on a tissue and then put the tissue near his face to breathe it in. Um, you can also make a warm uh, essential oil bath and kind of soak in a bath and help breathe in those oils. So diarrhea and constipation. So now we're going to move into kind of the bowels. And this can be caused by both chemotherapy 
um, radiation, infection, and then diet. So one of the common chemotherapy drugs linked to diarrhea is arinotecan. And the thing I learned in school to remember this was I run to the can. So it's a good good way to teach your patients. This is a good a known side effect, and it's a good way to think about kind of a, a drug name in a cute way so it's not as offensive. Um, big things are to notify your healthcare team if diarrhea doesn't improve over a day or two. If you ever start feeling dehydrated, like your mouth is super dry. If you have a fever associated with diarrhea, because that could be a sign of infectious diarrhea. And then if your stools are ever dark, black, or bloody. Um, so medications for you to manage your diarrhea. So paramide is the common over-the-counter drug that we recommend, or Imodium. Um, instructions that we tend to tell patients are two tablets at the first sign of diarrhea and one every two hours until you're diarrhea-free for 12 hours. And try not to do more than 12 tablets in a day. A lot of times, if it's not slowing down after the first six hours, it's a good idea just to call your provider because it's probably not going to work that well for you. Um, Lomoto and optreotide are both prescription medications to help manage diarrhea. And patients who have a more severe case of diarrhea, we may need to alternate with paramide and Lomoto throughout the day to slow it down. Um, dietary wise, it's good to kind of eat more of that bland foods, things that don't upset your stomach, so that brat diet, bananas, rice, applesauce, toast, even you know some chicken to, to get some protein in with some crackers is a good option. Um, and then again, hydration is key here. So Gatorade, Pedialyte, some, some kind of electrolyte solution. I know a lot of patients say that the Gatorade flavor is too strong, so they cut it. 50-50 with water so that it's not as strong of a flavor for them because they don't really like that sweetness of it. Um, and then constipation can be due to medication, so chemotherapy, opioids, the antiemetics, so the serotonin antagonist drug class or Zofran, if you take that on a more regular basis, can cause constipation. Um, being dehydrated or actually having a blockage of the path of the stool can be another reason why patients can get constipated. Um, typically, we recommend a combination of a stimulant laxative and a stool softener. So we think of that mush and push. So the docusate is a stool softener or colase. And then the uh, center or bisacodyl, those are both stimulants to help stimulate to move the stool out. So it's good to kind of angle it both ways. There's a lot of other over-the-counter medications that you can use. Um, but always talk to your provider first before you kind of manage uh, constipation on your own. The big thing is typically to avoid any fiber-based uh, medication for constipation because you're dehydrated. This could cause a major blockage. Um, some dietary things you can think about are prunes or prune juice. And then again, staying hydrated, exercise can even help stimulate the bowels. So there's other things besides medications you can do. If you don't like taking a pill, um, there is Senna tea that you can buy. Uh, it's thin with the regular teas, and sometimes it's called Smooth Move, and that can help as well. So sore mouth or mouth ulcers are another side effect of the chemotherapy. And this is because your mouth cells are overturning. And these can feel like a canker sore. So ways to help are to keep your mouth clean uh, and moist. So making sure you're brushing your teeth and rinsing your mouth regularly. Really important to avoid any alcohol-containing mouth rinses. So always read the back of kind of the bottle. Um, Biotin is a good brand that we know doesn't contain alcohol. And then Listerine Zero doesn't have alcohol. So there's a lot of different options. Um, it's also good to avoid any spicy, acidic food alcoholic beverages or tobacco, because that can irritate the mouth more and take, make the sores take longer to heal. You can even try your own concoction of mouth rinses. So we recommend an 8-ounce glass of warm water with 2 teaspoons of baking soda and a teaspoon of salt. And this makes a nice neutral solution to help kind of heal the mouth and clean out the mouth. There's also prescription medications that we can give for a mouth rinse that contain lidocaine. You can uh, sometimes hear this called magic mouthwash. Uh, different organizations and different pharmacies have different names for it. Um, but the big key is that lidocaine helps numb the area and can make it a little easier to eat or drink. 
but it doesn't last very long. So it's good to use that mouth rinse, wait a little, a few minutes, and then try to eat or drink. Taste changes is another really common complaint, and this is typically from the fluorouracil and the oxaliplatin drug. And some people get really frustrated because they're looking forward to eating, you know, maybe a steak dinner or a particular food that they like, and they take their first bite, and it doesn't taste anything like they think it's going to. Um, often patients say there's a metallic taste to food. Um, the taste buds do kind of change over time, and this does go away usually after chemotherapy finishes, but it can take weeks for that to resolve. Um, it is it's super frustrating, and we don't want this to impact your diet, so we really want you, when you are eating, to do your best to do smaller meals, high-protein meals, so that you don't lose weight and it doesn't impact your diet too much. Um, some helpful tips are trying mint or lemon candy to change the taste in your mouth before you eat. So lemon heads are one of those kind of tart lemon candies that sometimes helps with this. Using a good mouth rinse to kind of rinse this taste out of your mouth. Um, again, that baking soda salt mouth rinse is a good option. Trying a lot of different herbs and spices. So try different flavors that you never really liked before just to see if they taste good to you now. Um, try to eat fresh food. Avoid anything in cans. If it is associated with a metallic taste, sometimes that makes it worse. And then meat sometimes tastes metallic. So trying to eat eggs, fish, beans as your source of protein. And another tip is plastic or wooden silverware can help minimize that metallic taste as opposed to using the traditional metal silverware. Um, so now kind of those general side effects apply to the cytotoxic drugs we've already talked about, but there's some additional unique side effects to these agents. So fluorouracil is um, associated with skin sensitivity to sunlight. So it's really important to get it out covering up when you're outside. It's winter time, so it's colder in most of the country right now. So it's usually not as much of a problem, um, but definitely using sunscreen and avoiding peak hours, so that 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Hand foot syndrome or palmo plantar erythema. Um, this is associated with fluorouracil, and what that is is kind of a drying out and irritation of the palms of the hands and the soles of the feet. And we'll talk more about how to manage this later. Hapecitidine also is associated with hand foot syndrome and seems to be a little worse than the IV formulation of the fluorouracil. It's also good to think about drug-drug interactions, so be good about notifying your provider about what therapies you're taking. So St. John's wort, one of the herbal therapies, has drug interactions with heat cytidine, warfarin, um, even a blood pressure medicine car called carvedilol can have a drug interaction. Then oxaliplatin has a unique side effect of neuropathy, and this is both sensitivity to cold and also that traditional pins and needles feeling of the tips of toes and fingers. Um, and this we'll also talk about a little later. And then arinotecan is associated with what we call a cholinergic reaction. So basically excess like liquid production. So sweat, tears, saliva. So more of that than normal. And then also two different kinds of diarrhea. So an acute diarrhea that can happen during the infusion or shortly after the infusion that can feel like cramping stomach pain. And then diarrhea that starts the day after treatment. And this can be managed with loperamide at home. So our monoclonal antibodies um, work on those blood vessels again. So that's why hypertension or high blood pressure is a side effect. And this is treated just like traditional hypertension. So um, your primary care provider can manage the hypertension. We tend to manage it because it's caused by our drugs. Proteinuria is another side effect, which is excess protein in the urine. Um, this can be associated with high blood pressure or from the um, monoclonal antibody itself. And there are some rare side effects to bevacizumab, like arterial thrombosis or a clot that we would uh, monitor for very closely. Any excess bleeding, uh, gastrointestinal perforation, and this would be severe abdominal pain that we'd want you to follow for right away. And then delayed wound healing. This even includes any dental procedures. So your dentists want to know about these therapies, and we may need to hold chemotherapy before or even after to help you with that wound healing. Zivofulvercept has kind of these same side effects, but also has a drug-induced um, liver elevation, so it can make some of your liver enzymes higher, and that's something we monitor in the laboratory. Diarrhea is associated with this, those decreased blood cell counts we already talked about, and bleeding. 
And then cetuximab and panitumumab are associated with an acne form rash. So it looks a lot like teenage acne, and we'll talk about how to manage this later. Uh, low magnesium is another side effect from these drugs. And this is just from the body's inability to hold on to magnesium. So ways that you can help manage this in your diet are dark leafy greens, nuts and seeds, fish, beans, and my personal favorite is dark chocolate. So dark chocolate has a decent amount of magnesium in it. And then also allergic reactions or an infusion type reaction, which again is something you want to tell the nurses about right away during your infusion. The volumab and pembrolizumab work on the immune system to try to rev it up and attack the cancer cells, but they also can attack your normal tissue and normal cells. So you can have uh, immune-mediated rash, and that can be all over your body. Diarrhea, um, some adrenal problems, so it can attack the thyroid gland, which cause hypothyroidism, some liver problems, and then also fatigue. And these uh, need to be managed typically with steroids because we need to try to blunt the immune system from attacking those cells. And it's important to notify your providers right away about these side effects because the earlier we initiate steroids, the easier it is to manage and get the uh, side effect to resolve. And finally, the unique oral therapy. So regorafenib, again, has that hand-foot syndrome, but it also has a different kind of skin rash that can happen anywhere in the body. And this is a maculopapular rash. So what that means is kind of flat raised areas that can be red in color. Um, also, fatigue is common, that protein area and hypertension because it acts like um, the bevacizumab on the VEGF. And then also drug-drug interactions. So grapefruit is one, so grapefruit juice. Um, eating grapefruit can have drug interaction with regorafenib and then St. John's wort and even some medications to treat hypertension or that high blood pressure like rebeta blockers and calcium channel blockers can have a drug interaction. And the trifluridine and tapiracil, so fatigue is fairly common, the decreased blood cell counts, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and that's because this drug works very similarly to the traditional cytotoxic drugs, the 5-FU and leucovorin. It's very similar to that, so it has uh, very similar side effects. So now we'll get into kind of the management of the unique side effects. So hand foot syndrome, that drying of the palms or the hands and soles of the feet, the best way to manage this is with moisturizing creams and lotions. So Aquaphor, Eucerin, Utter Cream are all really great. Um, you can even do the white cotton glove and sock treatment after you put lotion on, so to sleep in gloves and socks to help kind of keep that moisture in. It's really important to avoid friction in any tight shoes. So uh, make sure your shoes are comfortable and not really compressing your foot. And then using cooler water when washing to help uh, not dry out the skin and irritate the skin. Then the acneiform rash from your cetuximab and panitubumab that looks like teenage acne. Big thing, don't use acne medications on this kind of a rash, even though it looks like acne. Um, it typically presents on the face and the chest. Uh, but the acne medications can irritate it and make it worse. Your providers will typically prescribe hydrocortisone and a clindamycin topical cream or gel to put on this. And then some patients may also get oral antibiotics. Um, doxycycline or minocycline are the two used most commonly. And this can be given ahead of time to help prevent the rash or once the rash develops to kind of treat and manage the rash. It's really important to keep the skin well moisturized and avoid any topical agents with alcohol, perfumes, and dyes. Cetaphil is a really nice gentle cleanser to use, um, help wash the skin, and then also make sure that you're using more cooler water again to uh, minimize the irritation and the drying out of the skin. And also mm. sunscreen is key, so SPF 30 or higher to help uh, prevent the sun from irritating the skin at all. So neuropathy. It's most commonly associated with oxaliplatin. So you can have the traditional neuropathy and then also the cold-induced neuropathy. The traditional neuropathy is that pins and needles, numbness and tingling feeling. Um, this side effect is cumulative, so the more doses you receive, the more likely it is to occur. And it may improve after treatment, but some patients it never completely goes away. This can be managed with antidepressants. So the drug used most commonly from this class is Cymbalta or Duloxetine. Um, so it has uh, additional activity of helping with neuropathy and helping with depression. And we use similar doses for both. 
and then anticonvulsants. Um, and the lidocaine patches are another great option because they act locally and they can be cut to apply specifically to wherever part of the hand or the foot is really irritated. Um, cold induced neuropathy. So this is kind of a guaranteed side effect of oxalicotin. And the big thing is try to avoid cold for 7 to 10 days. And that's impossible when you live in the northeast or somewhere that's cold. But you want to make sure that you're well covered up. You've got a scarf or a mask to breathe through. You're wearing gloves and hats. Um, and making sure that you don't go into the refrigerator or the freezer to pull out anything cold to eat or drink. You want to have room temperature food and beverages during this time. And then make sure that you tell your provider if you notice that sensitivity to cold is lasting more than that typical 7 to 10 day period. We want it to be completely resolved before you receive your next dose of chemotherapy. So it's important to note that all the side effects we've talked about don't happen at once. And we need to continuously be monitoring you know, to make sure that if you do develop a side effect, we manage it early and that you have resolved or we've at least minimized the symptoms before you get your next dose of treatment. And how we monitor toxicities are done through many methods. So we want to think about adverse effects. So are they acute, delayed, cumulative, or persistent? So Acute would be like that arenotechian diarrhea that can happen you know, during the infusion or shortly after the infusion, or an infusion-related reaction like the cetuximab that can happen during the infusion. Uh, delayed, so arenotechian diarrhea or the nausea vomiting that happens days after treatment. Um, cumulative, like the oxalicotin neuropathy. We want to know the more cycles. Is it getting worse, or when does it actually start for you? And then persistent. So those taste changes that may persist even after the chemotherapy is done. So we want to classify these adverse effects by when they occur. And then also we're going to look at severity. And we have a grading system where we want to see that it's gone down in severity before you get your next treatment and it's safe to give you treatment. Also laboratory assessments need to be done. Um, most commonly will be before you get every treatment. And sometimes you might do it in between based on how you're tolerating. So we get what we call a CBC, or complete blood count. And that's looking at those white cells, red cells, and platelets. And then we also get a BMP or a CMP to look at your electrolytes, liver function, and renal function. We also do a head-to-toe assessment um, through a physical exam. We want to check your mental health and well-being. So are you feeling stressed? Do you have a lot of anxiety? Are you depressed? Is the financial toxicity of treatment affecting you and are you having to miss work because you're not doing well on chemotherapy. And then the big thing is quality of life. So we want to make sure we haven't impacted your activities of daily living and what you actually enjoy to do, enjoy doing. So a good example of this is someone who's a big skier because I'm from Colorado, we think about this a lot, is that sensitivity to cold with oxalipatin. So oxalipatin wouldn't be a good treatment option because we would totally diminish their quality of life with them having to avoid kind of that cold weather. So big thing, you know, thinking about side effects and management of those, we need you to communicate well with your team because if we don't know what's going on with you, we can't help. So before starting therapy, it's always good to discuss kind of your current medication list. And this includes over-the-counter medicines, herbal supplements. Um, medical marijuana is legal in Colorado and recreational marijuana. So that's one a lot of patients don't like disclosing. But it is important because it can have drug-drug interactions um, particularly with Cape cytobine is one we like to know about. Vaccinations is another one. So we try to make sure all of our patients are vaccinated with a flu shot, but we want to make sure it's an inactivated vaccine. So actually the shot and not the intranasal uh, flu vaccine. And then alcohol and tobacco intake. So tobacco actually can have drug-drug interactions if you're a regular tobacco user. Um, patients with liver disease or elevated liver function, we think about alcohol as a potential risk um, and cause. And then acetaminophen or Tylenol over the counter, we tend to recommend patients with liver metastases not use that or any liver disease. Also knowing a good complete current medical history and family medical history is important. So patients with diabetes who already have neuropathy, we may want to avoid our chemotherapy regimens that can cause neuropathy. Or someone who has hypertension or high blood pressure at baseline, we want that to be um, optimally managed before we initiate a therapy that could cause high blood pressure. 
And then anyone who's got kind of a strong anxiety component, we want to make sure that we provide appropriate therapy for antiemetics. Uh, to prevent that nausea piece. And then another thing to think about is pregnancy and contraception. So not all of our chemo drugs can cause basically infertility, but we do want to know if you have a desire to become pregnant so that we can appropriately address those concerns. And then contraception during treatment. Um, it's really important to make sure the patients are on reliable contraception um, because we don't want anyone getting pregnant during therapy because therapy can severely damage a fetus or a new baby. So teamwork. So it's important to think that you're a part of your care. Don't be afraid to ask questions. You're, speak openly and honestly with all your health care providers. Make sure you're being understood and that you understand what's being said. So don't ask for clarification or ask to speak to someone different who can maybe explain things a little differently to you. And make a plan for your treatment and care. It's not a bad idea to have one consistent person try to come to all your visits with you so that they can help be an advocate for you as well. And then we want to make sure that you discuss all your treatment options with us. So a common thing is kind of deciding between full fox and cape fox because they're both very similar regimens. Cape cytobine is oral. If you've got a patient who doesn't want to be in the infusion center as often, then cape fox might be a better option than full fox. That's also important to thoroughly discuss all the potential side effects and the symptoms that may happen and how you can manage those. And then any other issues that are important to you. Some personal information to share with your team that's helpful is kind of the type of work and degree of physical work or mental stress involved. So what do you do for a living? What's kind of important to you? Any close relatives who have had cancer and their types of cancer, because some of our colon cancer patients have a genetic component, so a family component, that we want to make sure other family members might be screened earlier. And then how much you know about cancer and its treatment. So if you're a physician coming to our office, then we might want to talk to you on a different level than if you have no medical background. And how much research you've done. One of the big um, concerns is the patients who stay up all night on the internet looking for anything and everything about their disease. Um, it can be a very dangerous place and it's easy to get lost in the internet with a volume of information out there and what's reliable and what's not. Um, also, how you're affected by family problems, money problems, work-related stress, or other issues. So things that we might be able to help put you in touch with resources. Kind of your hobbies or other interests. Like I mentioned, if you're a big skier, then oxalipotin might not be a good option for you. Your goals for quality of life during and after treatment. Um, desire for children in the future because of the impact of fertility. And then any important cultural beliefs as far as treatment options go. So it's really important to know your resources. There's a ton of complementary and alternative therapies like that aromatherapy or acupuncture. Um, dietary and nutritional support is always a good uh, support system to loop in. Here we actually have um, cooking classes that our dietitians put on at our wellness center. And we have support groups here. Um, financial counseling is always a big piece, especially with our oral chemotherapy drugs that are newer that could be very expensive. Um, physical activity, so is there a gym or a Y or somewhere near you that has actually uh, physical activities for cancer patients or cancer survivors that uh, kind of tailor it to your level and your activity abilities. Um, and then palliative care is something to definitely talk about and bring in. Um, it can sound scary, um, most people think about it as end of life, but it's really just additional resource and an extra support to help manage your symptoms and side effects. And then lastly, kind of some good resources and websites. So Fight Colorectal Cancer has a lot of great information on it. There's a section on managing side effects. They have support group information and resources. The American Cancer Society is another great resource. ChemoCare is one that we use a lot for drug information resources. They have really great patient-friendly information. And the National Cancer Institute also has a section on its website for resources for patients. And again, use your healthcare team. It's typically made up of you, definitely in the center, and then you have different providers that are all there to support you and make sure you have a successful treatment. And thank you guys very much, and I'll try to address any questions or comments you guys have.
Great. Thank you so much, Ashley. Um, what a wonderful presentation and really thorough discussion on side effects. Um, we did have a couple questions come through. Um, again, if you have questions and you're, you're listening uh, currently on the right side of your screen, you can type those in. Um, so we'll, we'll just go ahead and, and get started. Um, so we have a question from a runner uh, about 25 to 35 miles a week. Um, awesome. That's a, a lot of miles. Uh, but the question particularly is around um, exercise and um, being on chemotherapy and how that might contribute to side effects, uh, positive or negative. Um, is there any kind of guideline around how much exercise um, is too much? Um, there's not really a lot of guideline on how much exercise is too much. What we really say is if you've been an avid runner, then keep up with that the best you can. You know, Understand that you might be a little more fatigued. I might not be able to do a 10 mile run, it might be more like 8, but we really recommend keeping up your activity as much as you can and there's actually data to support that that does have benefits on your treatment overall if you can keep up with your activities. All right, the second question, um, if I'm experiencing an acute side effect, is there a specific time frame in which I need to call the doctor? Um, it's really side effect specific, so if, if you're having diarrhea, then I would try to manage that with a medium maybe and staying hydrated and, you know, after a couple hours, if it's not getting better, then call the provider. Um, the same with nausea, it tends to take about an hour for those medicines to kick in after you take them, so, you know, give them at least a chance to work before you go ahead and call the provider. But if you're having a fever or signs and symptoms of an infection, that's a reason to call right away. That kind of feeds into our next question, Ashley, specifically um, around diarrhea. And if a pa if a patient is on something like Imodium, how and you know nothing is um, improving, how how many hours, how many days is recommended before reaching out to the to the provider? Um, it really depends. So we have 24-7 access, so we tend to like patients to call no matter what time of day it is. If your providers are only open during business hours, then I would call maybe within that business hour window, even if it's only been a couple hours, to make sure you can get a prescription for a Lamotil or at least get in contact with them to see do they want you to wait or do they want you to go to a closest emergency room, depending upon where you live. Great. Thank you. Um, we have a couple more questions here. Um, we have one about neuropathy. Um, it's kind of a two-part question here. Well, I'm going to combine two questions. One, the first okay. is, how long does the neuropathy last after chemo? And then as a follow-up, um, we know that neuropathy really affects a lot of, a lot of survivors. Um, do you know of any research going on in the field that could help kind of reduce these symptoms after treatment? Um, so to answer the first question, how long it lasts, is very patient specific. It can last weeks to really never going away completely. Um, so most patients, if they're going to get some resolution, will see some improvement within a couple months after stopping chemotherapy. And then in terms of research, there is some ongoing studies as far as uh, medications that will help manage neuropathy. In the, it, for patients undergoing chemotherapy, not as much research ongoing for those who are survivors after they've completed chemotherapy. Um, it's just a hard thing to manage because it's better to prevent it than really manage it after it develops. It's hard to get those nerves to regenerate. Great. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see, I think we have time for one more. Um, all right, let's see. Are you more or less concerned about late late-term side effects of immunotherapy than you were five years ago? Um, I think definitely we're, the more we're learning about immunotherapy drugs, our comfort level is increasing, but we really don't have enough experience with the immunotherapies to really understand the late-term side effects and what we should be looking for. Uh, we do know that a lot of the side effects happen weeks after we initiate therapy, so we don't see those acute side effects like we do with traditional cytotoxic drugs, um, but we're really not sure like how long after they even finish therapy should we be monitoring for side effects such as 
kind of that thyroid impact with the hypothyroidism and any impact on the adrenal glands. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like research is kind of ongoing in this area. Right. Yeah. Um, Ashley, if you don't mind, we have just one more question that came through. Okay. Um, and the question is, does the toxicity from chemotherapy eventually go away? Um, so that definitely depends on which toxicities you're talking about. For the, most of them, you will see kind of resolution. Uh, taste bud changes are one that took a while to go away. Neuropathy may never go away. Typically, nausea vomiting does go away. Kind of your GI tract heals itself. But some people will have residual kind of nausea feelings. Um, diarrhea tends to resolve, so you usually don't see that prolonged after treatment. But depending upon if you've had radiation, that could kind of prolong that effect or maybe make it so that it doesn't completely resolve. Well, thank you so much, um, Ashley, for your expertise. And thank you to all for tuning in. Um, it was a really wonderful webinar. We learned a lot. Um, and just as a reminder, um, the slides are available or will be available. Um, after the webinar, the recording will be available also and can be found um, on the Fight CRC webinar. So feel free to check that out uh, following uh, the, the webinar. And thank you again. Have a wonderful day. Thanks, Ashley. Thank you.